Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Trends and Strategies in Volunteer Engagement. My name is Lorette Edelman. I'm the Assistant Director at the New Hampshire Center for Nonprofits. We are so excited to be able to offer this webinar to you today, and we welcome the nonprofits who have registered to participate from all over the country. We're psyched that we have so many nonprofits who are interested in volunteer engagement in addition to the New Hampshire Center for Nonprofits. Before we get started, we have a couple of housekeeping items to cover briefly. Today's webinar will be recorded and we'll be posting it on Nonprofit Next within the next few days. So we'll send out um, a notice to let you know when the recording is available. We would love to hear from you through this presentation. Uh, we like it when we have interactive webinars. We'll be answering questions at key points throughout, throughout the presentation, but please feel free to send your questions using your chat box um, in your, which can be found on your control panel. Your phone is muted right now, but if needed, we will be able to unmute your phone during the Q&A section of the presentation. I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker today. The New Hampshire Center for Nonprofits has worked with Beth over the last few years, and we love working with her and her team, and we know that you'll enjoy her presentation. Beth Steinhorn is president of VQ Volunteer Strategies, which is based in Colorado. Beth partners with organizations to increase their impact through strategic and innovative engagement and has authored multiple books and articles on strategic volunteer engagement. Beth is a popular speaker and trainer throughout the country, and she regularly participates in the national dialogue about volunteerism and engagement. VQ Volunteer Strategies is currently the lead consultant for the New Hampshire Center for Nonprofits High Impact Volunteer Engagement Initiative, which we have gotten funding through the Corporation for National and Community Service. We love working with Beth, and we're very happy to turn the webinar over. So happy Tuesday, Beth, and take it away. Thanks, Lorette, and thanks to the New Hampshire Center for Nonprofits and Volunteer New Hampshire for uh, building this webinar into our larger Hive High Impact Volunteer Engagement Initiative. I'm really delighted to be presenting today to all of you across the country on the topic of trends and issues in volunteer engagement. As nonprofit leaders, all of you across the nation have a choice. You are experiencing a variety of trends that may be affecting the ways volunteers do or don't engage with your organization. And your choice is to leverage these trends or work despite these trends. We can all think of instances, hopefully outside of our own organizations, of individuals or organizations that bump up and work against trends no matter what the situation is. But what I'd like to share with you today and the topic of our, of our uh, webinar this afternoon is how we can ensure that we're not missing opportunities to leverage trends because we are ignoring them. So with that said, I'd love to start by getting your voices, at least your uh, keyboards, in the room a little bit. We do have um, dozens of people on the call, uh, nearly uh, uh, already over 60 people on the call with a few more still dialing in. Um, so uh, we won't be able to read every comment, but I'd love to know from some of you participants using your chat box or probably your question box, what are some of the experiences you're facing at your organization around volunteer engagement? Um, so I'll, while people are typing in some of their thoughts, my question, you know, a different way to phrase that question is, what are volunteers asking for or expecting out of you that perhaps is different than five, 10, 20, 30 years ago, depending on whether you've been in the field as long as I've been. Um, what are some of the um, expectations of staff around volunteer engagement? How are those things changing? In a moment, again, while some folks are typing, I hope sharing a few examples. Um, I'll be sharing in just a moment some of the many things we hear as we travel around the country 
meeting with organizations, doing research on volunteer engagement, and helping organizations develop strategies to achieve their mission more effectively through strategic engagement. Ah, so now I've tap danced long enough. We have lots of answers pouring in. Here are a couple of the things that some of you on this call uh, are experiencing. High level volunteer opportunities. While volunteers are seeking to do high level volunteer opportunities or to um, fill high level roles, staff don't want to create them and don't have time to train them. Um, others are adding, so thank you Sharna for that, others are adding that we find decreased follow through from volunteers. So to me that, that raises a question which we'll be talking about today a little bit around are you vetting volunteers? Are you screening them appropriately? And are you expecting volunteers to stay longer than they really want to stay? We often hear that, and someone else, Carol, jumped in with this, you don't seem to be getting as many long-term commitments from volunteers, more like a one and done, um, which could relate to that comment earlier from Autumn, who notes that there's not as much follow-through. Is it that there isn't follow-through, or is it that individuals are seeking short-term opportunities opportunities with your organization, yet perhaps, and I don't know what organization you're representing, so I don't mean to be picking on you, particularly Autumn, it's just questions to think about, are you um, only offering opportunities that were designed perhaps a few decades ago that, it, that, that relied on volunteers signing up for a year-long commitment or two-year-long commitments? And to the other point around um, one and dones, how can you look at this interest in short-term days of service opportunities, which we'll be talking about a little bit, and turn those one and dones into gateways for deeper engagement. Um, let's see a couple other, uh, couple other comments. Um, ah, another scheduling and time issue. Potential volunteers who want drop-ins when, when it's convenient for me uh, types of opportunities or groups that select a date, time, and number of volunteers and then expect us to make it work. A lot of volunteers see engagement as a consumer-driven, I mean, really our, our, our world has shifted somewhat to a more consumer-driven world around volunteer engagement because volunteers and the organizations, perhaps the companies they represent, are seeking uh, are seeking very specific criteria and want us to meet them. So today's, so thank you all. I'm sorry I didn't get to read all of them, but hopefully we'll, we'll touch on many of the, the other trends um, that we didn't have time to read. What we're going to be doing today over the next 50 minutes or so is talking about how uh, some of these trends and others that we've been experiencing um, in order to share uh, give you a perspective so that perhaps you can begin to adapt your existing strategies to not work despite these trends, but instead leverage these trends. So what are some of the things you all mentioned and issues that in fact we see and hear often as we travel the country working with organizations like yours? The first is time, and that was the first thing that many of you mentioned, time. People are viewing time differently and demanding a different type of time commitment of our organizations. We'll talk about that. Technology. How does technology continue to transform the ways that individuals connect with and serve organizations? A third issue we'll talk about is changing economics. Um, the economy is, is integrally linked with volunteer trends, so we'll talk briefly about that as well. We'll also talk a little bit about evolving philanthropy. How and where do, does uh, philanthropy fund and fund development overlap with volunteer engagement, and how can we strengthen those connections to everyone's advantage? We'll also be talking about generational shifts. How do new emerging generations of volunteers, are they challenging and or evolving the, the model and expectations around volunteer engagement with our organizations? So these are all pretty big topics and we have now 
40, 45 minutes left to go over them. So I'll be moving through all of these topics pretty quickly, um, and then we'll share uh, some a couple throughout, I'll be sharing strategies and ways that different organizations have piloted or adapted their approaches to volunteer engagement to take advantage of these different trends. And then I'll share some overview strategies that you can take with you, and then we'll certainly leave some time at the end for questions. So if a question pops in your head during the webinar at any point, please do use your question uh, your question box and write it in and we'll we'll try to get to as many of those at the end of the webinar as we can. So let's jump in with that first trend, time. You know, so often nowadays, when we ask someone, a friend or acquaintance, how are you? It is incredibly common for the answer to be a measure of time, for the answer to be, uh, I'm busy. You know, years ago, that wasn't necessarily a, a measure of your state of being, but the fact is people view time as something certainly to be filled, and it's a badge of honor if we're so busy that we don't have time to do everything perhaps that we, that we want to do, because people say they have less and less time, and yet we know from research and from personal experience, of course, that people make time for things they value and for things for which they feel valued. So the shift in this whole conversation about time and volunteering is that now it's incumbent upon us as organizational leaders to make the case why it's, why Sharing your time with our organization will be a wise investment. Why your time will be valuable and valued if you choose to invest it in our organization. And that has shifted significantly from when I started well, a long time ago, many decades ago, in nonprofits and volunteer engagement. The next trend that I mentioned is technology. Technology opens up new worlds to engage volunteers remotely and to involve volunteers or tap into volunteers' existing networks of people. Technology has, in ways I think 10, 15, 20 years ago, we could still only just begin to imagine, it has opened up and expanded our networks, connecting us with individuals with whom we're no longer just in you know, people that we currently live, learn, work, and play with, we are able to connect virtually with hundreds and in many cases thousands of individuals who are connected to us through similar interests, through shared organizational affiliations. So on the one hand, the question is how can we as organizations engage volunteers who may only be remotely, both physically and in, in other ways, remotely connected to our organization. But to me, even more compelling than the idea of virtual volunteering is the question of how can we turn our existing volunteers and stakeholders into talent scouts and ambassadors on behalf of our organizations? How can we arm them with the tools and messages to tap into their networks on behalf of our mission? That to me is the most profound as yet unreached sort of frontiers of, of what technology can, can, can do for us in terms of engagement. The next piece that I mentioned is changing economics. Whether it was a recession like the prolonged recession that we had back in 2009, 10, 11, or some of the current unknowns about how uh, perhaps this tax reform will affect our economy now that we're in 2018, economics are integrally linked to volunteer engagement trends. With that recent recession that I mentioned, unemployment and underemployment were at record levels. Uh, underemployment meaning individuals who were working but perhaps only part-time or working in a field that wasn't really their chosen profession that tapped into their professional skills. So with unemployment and underemployment at record levels, 
that really that that situation that circumstance sealed the deal on on volunteerism as a resume builder this was a trend that was already well in the works but that recession really solidified the idea that job seekers could list volunteerism on their resume on their linkedin profiles as a value add as a way to keep their resumes fresh build their resumes so that when they could seek full-time employment uh, they would have a consistent flow um, career of, of skills use and, and professional development and in fact even this data i'm going to quote is a few years old by now but a few years ago uh, linkedin conducted a survey a study with um, I can never think of the right name for this, but with headhunters, with, with um, hiring HR professionals and, and individuals um, who tried to connect job seekers, qualified job seekers with high-level positions. And at that time, even a few years ago, already nearly half of these HR professionals were viewing volunteer work on par with paid employment as um, when they evaluated a candidate's experience. And, and that number, one can imagine, has only grown significantly since then. The other piece about changing economics is, is around philanthropy. Uh, and, and a piece, an important piece that many of us in the nonprofit world, because so many times our, our nonprofits are so siloed, we don't recognize the integral ties between giving and volunteering. And the bottom line is people give their money where they give their time. And people give their time where they give their money if they're asked. So as I, as I share a few highlights about evolving philanthropy, I'd love for you to think about how your development departments, if you're a large enough organization to have a, a dedicated full-time fund development officer, and maybe a large department to support him or her. How is your development department working with volunteer services to ensure that there's a unified strategy around philanthropy and volunteerism? As I noted before, people give their money where they give their time. A few years back, U.S. Trust, actually just about a year or two ago, U.S. Trust released uh, a wonderful study, as did uh, Fidelity Charitable Trust, around the links between donating time and donating money. U.S. Trust's study specifically looked at high net worth donors, individuals with a household income of about $200,000 or more. And 70% of high net worth donors give money where they volunteer. And when asked which is most meaningful to you, more people selected or personally fulfilling, more people selected giving time than giving money. So again, I ask, how can we, um, how can we tap into this to increase and enhance our, our volunteering and the impact from the volunteers who work with us? Another trend in philanthropy is, of course, the increase in corporate philanthropy and service, which relates to this increased effort and demand by younger workforces, especially to have employee engagement opportunities. Yes. So often I hear people, and there were some comments on the screen about this as well, um, talk about uh, the phone calls that, that they receive uh, from, from companies saying, okay, we want to bring a group. We want to do you a huge favor. We want to bring a group of uh, you know, 38 staff members on this day for three hours, and the last hour we need a meeting a room so that we can do some team building, and we're all going to wear matching t-shirts and we want to do something really important um, and meaningful. And, um, and it's not that I, I, I want to dismiss employee engagement. I think it's, it's a great opportunity, but oftentimes it puts a burden on us as organizational representatives to create work or find meaningful ways to engage these large groups in a one in a one and done, as, as someone noted earlier. So my question to you is, how can you proactively work with this trend to get beyond these requests for 
days of service volunteering. How can you reach out and talk about pro bono service opportunities and say, yes, we may be able to meet that request, but in the meantime, we have this project and we would love to tap into your project manager uh, professionals to help us set up a timeline. We'd love to tap into your tech team, your IT department at your organization for some training for our staff or volunteers around better leveraging our own technology. How can you create pro bono service opportunities to tap into this trend? Finally, the last trend in evolving philanthropy is the increase, dramatic increase and steady increase in donor advised funds. This trend of having donors and families taking the long view of, of their charitable giving in terms of investments is something else that I think is worth exploring. How can we tap into this concept, this idea of taking the long view and, and, um, and incorporate volunteer engagement into that as well? So all of these together, I think, underscore an opportunity for your, uh, the, those in your organization, including leadership, who work with engagement, as well as those who work with fund development, to talk to each other and develop a unified strategy. The last trend I want to talk about, uh, and we'll go into it in, in some level of, of, of more detail, is this question of generational patterns. It's a topic I love to explore, um, especially because for the first time in American history, we have four generations, soon to be five, not only working side by side, but volunteering side by side. So before I go into depth in each generation, let me just introduce you to each generation as I'll be defining them this afternoon. First, we have the traditionalists, those who were born before or during World War II, also known as greatest and silent generation volunteers. They have been motivated throughout their lives to volunteer out of loyalty and duty. They sign up to volunteer because they're joiners of organizations, but they continue to show up because it's the right thing to do and they have a duty to fulfill that commitment. After this generation came the baby boomers, born between 1946 and 1964, the boomers have been career oriented. They certainly were known for their work in the 60s to change the world. Uh, and once they entered their 60s about 10 years ago, they seek to leave a social legacy. They were the first generation who chose not to stay in the same jobs, the same cities, the same houses, dare I say, even the same marriages. And yet, our volunteer systems were built on an expectation that they would stay in the same volunteer role till they earned their 20-year pin. But organizations quickly learned, starting about 10 years ago, that we couldn't expect boomers to stay in the same volunteer positions either. They were the first to demand shorter volunteer opportunities, more flexible time commitments, and a volunteer career path. After, X, uh, after boomers came Generation X. That's me, I will admit, admittedly, uh, I'm, I teeter on the edge of boomerdom. Uh, but Xers are small in numbers and little discussed when sandwiched between baby boomers and boomers' children, the millennials. Yet Xers, believe it or not, are leading the nation in volunteer rates. So if you're not thinking about and talking about Xers, you certainly should be at your organization. Generation Xers entered a workforce expecting to be able to come of age professionally and fill the management positions that boomers would be vacating. Well, of course, due to the recession and also due to personal goals and different views of retirement, those boomers aren't retiring anytime soon. And so as Xers began to anticipate that, uh, Xers have uh, really tapped into that entrepreneurial spirit and, um, and have been uh, bringing that into their, their entrepreneurial spirit in terms of work into their volunteer work as well. So we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. And finally, there are the millennials, the children of boomers, large in numbers, passionate and energetic like their parents. Millennials seek to challenge the status quo. And they have, since childhood, stepped up to the plate as volunteers to make those changes. 
already more than one in five millennials volunteer, which is higher than any other generation at that age. Most of all, millennials want to have a seat at the decision-making table. They want influential roles. They're ready to be leaders and look for authentic leadership, not positions in name only. So here's the great news about all these different generational issues. The biggest gap in generational behavior is between the traditionalists at the top of this screen and everybody else. So even though I'm going to be talking about and sharing examples of organizations or strategies that effectively serve boomers, Xers, and millennials, remember that if you, if you get it right with one of these generations, you will be better positioned to get it right with others as well. So again, just to review, traditionalists, this generation is the generation born before or during World War II. And they grew up in a time of economic turmoil in the aftermath of the Great Depression. They dealt with it um, by working hard, being stoic, and, and certainly brought their duty-bound and um, respect for rules into their volunteer work. Again, this is the generation that built many of our nonprofits during the 20th century in the United States and created the volunteer model to serve them. Volunteer models designed to serve and reward individuals for long-term service um, and, uh, and built on a pyramid, like a volunteer ladder, where, where giving your time, serving your time, paying your dues um, would enable you to reach the pinnacle of service of being on a committee or being on a board. And as we'll see, many of these other generations have different motivations that aren't as tied to that traditional funnel up to a board position. Boomers, as, as I began to describe earlier, uh, was at the time of their birth the most populous generation. And they grew up typically amid economic prosperity with suburban, uh, uh, affluent suburban experience and nuclear families with, in many cases, stay at home, at least one stay at home parent, usually, of course, the, the mother. Boomers tend to be optimistic, competitive, and focus on personal accomplishment. They work hard. It is this generation, not their children, that increased our work week from 40 to 70 or 80 hours. It's this generation that created networking, perhaps not social networking online, but professional networking. And they bring all of these priorities to their volunteer experience as well. This generation had ruled the workplace for many years and is comfortable in the culture that they've created. Many companies, interestingly, experience their biggest generational conflict when boomer managers are confronted with younger employees who don't fit the mold that the boomers themselves have created. So in anticipation of boomers retiring, uh, again, about 10 years ago, there was a great deal of conversation in the nonprofit world around what can we expect from boomers. So in these mid-2000s, as nonprofits were waiting with great anticipation for 70-plus boomers to retire and flood our organizations as volunteers, organizations like Volunteer Match did some research to do a little bit of a reality check on what those boomers were thinking and expecting about retirement and how volunteerism would fit into it. And what we learned were that boomers were optimistic about retirement. This was pre-recession, I'll remind you. They viewed it as a time to spend more, or a chance to spend more time with family, with hobbies, and with leisure. Most planned to work in retirement. 79% of them were planning to work either out of necessity or out of desire. And for them, volunteering and service were integrally interwoven with retirement. More than half planned to devote more time to volunteering. And among those who were already volunteering, three and four viewed volunteering as one of the most important things in their lives. Boomers also knew what would make volunteering attractive. What would make volunteering attractive? Skills. Skills is what were the priorities 
for volunteering. Boomer men valued using their skills. Boomer women especially valued the opportunity to gain new skills. And it's not Xers or millennials who were the first to approach an organization and pass on the opportunity if it didn't fit their schedule and desire. It was, in fact, boomers who were interested in doing that. I'll go back and share one other bit of great data and a resource if you're interested in learning more about boomers, and that's Encore.org. Encore.org is one of the organizations that emerged out of this um, anticipation of boomers retiring, and their website includes a great deal of resources, not just for organizations seeking to engage volunteers, but for individuals seeking meaningful opportunities to volunteer as they entered this Encore phase of their life. And according to Encore.org, more than 25 million Americans aged 50 to 70 seek Encore careers. Their interests span many different topics, and they are really interested in serious commitments. So while we see from your comments earlier, and I hear it all the time, that individuals are approaching organizations but don't want to have long-term opportunities, how can you frame some of your high-level opportunities as an encore career opportunity? Someone who worked in the corporate world, now able to share their skills while also learning about the nonprofit world, Framing it as an encore opportunity might just tip the scales to get that individual interested in making a longer-term commitment with your organization. I'm going to briefly share a case study of one organization that did just, just as I've been dis describing in really leveraging boomer volunteers, and yet this process that I'm about to describe works for organizations no matter what volunteer generation you're seeking to fill or to, to tap. Presbyterian Intercommunity Hospital, PIH Health, is a health organization, a hospital in Whittier, California, that was re recognized that they had an important need. Their average age of volunteers was, uh, was much older. They had a lot of um, traditionalists, and they had some younger volunteers, but they did not have boomers or millennials, and yet there were lots in their area. So they instituted an initiative to try to identify ways that they could better reach and engage Boomer volunteers. They started by forming a team. Once they identified the need, they formed and launched a team that included four staff and four volunteers, all of whom were boomers, and all of whom were able to envision a different culture of engagement for the hospital. They even included, as a member of their team, talk about skilled boomers, a recently retired COO from another hospital in the community who wanted to share his skills with his field, but knew if he volunteered at his own hospital, everyone would be looking at him as their former boss. So he took his skills and went to the other hospital in town and became part of this volunteer engagement task force. They provided a full day training to the team to help them understand new strategies for volunteer engagement. And with that background, the team identified a number of issues, critical issues for change, pressing needs of the hospital. The team was charged with developing volunteer assignments that would intrigue and engage volunteers to address some of these critical needs. So what did this team do? They, in addition to their training, they interviewed staff throughout the organization, and they interviewed volunteers. They found that there were some policies that were barriers to engaging Boomer volunteers, like a long-standing expectation that you provide at least 100 hours of service over just a couple months. They got rid of that policy. And then they also worked with staff to identify pressing needs that skilled volunteers could help address. They recommended four new roles for volunteers. One were healthy living educators. Up until this time, only paid staff delivered education programs as part of their community engagement or community engagement mission of the hospital. So, of course, they recommended that the hospital tap into um, retired nurses or retired teachers or 
um, during the summer, even employed uh, teachers and educators to become healthy living educators and thereby really expanding the number of programs and people programs they could deliver and people they could reach. They also realized that their volunteer department wasn't engaging volunteers effectively, so they recommended having volunteers lead the orientations and even conduct interviews. The role that I think is most fascinating is the role of patient biographers. These individuals are, um, were tapped, these roles were created to help the hospital address the fact that the patients who stayed there over long periods of time rated their stay much lower than those who only were in the hospital for a couple days. And it was because these patients did not feel known. So this task force created the role of patient biographer. These individuals meet with patients who are long-term stay patients. They interview them, they learn about their life, and then they write up a short biography, vet it with the patient, and then it's framed in the room. It's as simple as that. And once it's up, an amazing thing happens. Doctors, phlebotomists, nurses all come in the room and read this thing on the wall, learn about the patient, and then they start having conversations with them. And within just a few months of this initiative being uh, launched, the patient satisfaction rating skyrocketed among those patients. So that's how they went about identifying needs and creating new roles for volunteers. Whether you are creating new roles for boomers or trying to enhance your existing roles for boomers, we have here a couple tips on how to recruit, recognize, and retain boomer volunteers. In terms of recruiting, communicate how these prospective volunteers can contribute through service. In terms of recognition, ensure that you identify the status and what sort of professional development they can expect. And finally, for retention, show how these boomer volunteers will be making a difference. In terms of Xers, we think about a generation that grew up in a very different world than previous generations. Divorce and working moms created a generation of latchkey kids. This led to traits of independence, resilience, and adaptability. Gen X feels really strongly, and I can relate to this, that I don't need someone looking over my shoulder. At the same time, it's a generation that expects immediate and ongoing feedback and is equally comfortable providing feedback to others. Maybe some of you can relate to, relate to that as I as an Xer can. Other traits of Xers include working very well in multicultural settings, a desire to have a little fun in the workplace, and a really pragmatic approach to getting things done. I'll share, as I just did with Boomers, I'll share a case study of an organization um, with whom I worked thanks to the New Hampshire Center for Nonprofits and our Hive initiative a few years ago that really found a way to address a strategic need and tap into volunteers of, in many cases for them in the extra generation. The River Center is a, a community service, a social service organization in New Hampshire that provides um, uh, uh, some safety net services and, and a variety of other services like tax preparation, um, emergency wood for heating uh, to their constituents. They had a number of programs that were actually volunteer run. They already had a lot of high impact volunteers in their midst before we began working with them. And one of them was a volunteer grant writer, a vital role that was entrusted into an unpaid staff member, a volunteer. But they also knew that they would benefit from having additional grant writers. They needed to not only have a pipeline in case this one volunteer left, um, but they also knew that they would benefit from having bigger capacity in terms of fund development. And their solution was a really fascinating one. They thought beyond only their own organization's needs. They saw an opportunity to help the entire community. That old saying, uh, a rising tide floats all boats is something that, that their leadership really embraced. So how did they go about finding a new team of grant writers? They organized grant writing circles, which was essentially a four-part class 
that promised to teach grant writing skills. It was designed and taught by their volunteer grant writer. And the part that I think is so brilliant is that the fee for taking this four-part class simply was researching and writing one grant for the River Center. Really brilliant, right? They engaged, they've run the course a couple times, um, and they have about six to ten people in each class. And in each class, these individuals are all expected to research and write one grant proposal for the River Center. Whether or, this, whether or not the students completed the, who completed the training stayed with the River Center or went somewhere else wasn't part of their um, concern. Of course, some of them have. One of them has even ended up joining the board. Another ended up moving away but stayed on as a remote volunteer to research and write grants for the organization. And even though they didn't set out to reach Xers, they did reach quite a few Gen Xers. It was a very attractive opportunity for Generation X to learn skills, continue to enhance their professional development, and, um, and have the flexibility to do this work on their own time and even on their own turf, which in fact are some of the hallmarks of what Xers are seeking in terms of volunteer engagement. When we talk about how to retain Gen X volunteers and how to reward them, recognize them, freedom is absolutely the ultimate reward. Giving candid, timely feedback, providing learning opportunities, and demonstrating the impact that Xers have all really speak to the hearts and hands of Xer volunteers. And as we continue and begin to kind of wrap up our whirlwind view of the tour of the generations, we'll share a little bit about millennials, and then I'll share a couple other models, um, our frameworks to think about as you begin to think about how to integrate some of this information into your volunteer engagement practices. And again, just a little reminder, if you have questions, we'll be pausing for questions in about 10 minutes, um, and we'll leave a good five to 10 minutes for questions at the end. So here we are with millennials. Millennials are the children of baby boomers, born from the mid 80s to uh, 2000. And this generation, um, like Xers before them, value independence, um, and are best known for their reluctance to commit to long-term commitments. And yet, there are many um, much more compelling uh, and I think positive reasons and uh, approaches to engaging vo millennial volunteers than simply thinking about what they don't do, which is what I hear so often when I'm out in the field. Millennials, more than any other generation before them, are driven to engage with causes to help people or the earth rather than engaging with institutions. So the question organizations must answer is how to inspire millennials to work with the organization as a way to connect with the cause rather than connecting with the organization. From a communication standpoint, many recent studies of millennial engagement prove the need for organizations to invest time and resources into helping a, a millennial feel and experience the cause that the organization serves. Investing in photography, video, digital storytelling, experiential learning, all these different visual ways to tell the story are worthwhile if they inspire a millennial to feel the need of the individual who's seeking assistance. It's up to, um, it's up to us as, as organizational leaders to tap into millennials' preferences uh, because these preferences are becoming more than just preferences. They're really becoming the norm. Organizations can no longer afford to cater only to older donors and older volunteers. Younger audiences demand that nonprofits they support evolve and show the true change in the issues that they address. So that's not just about having visual marketing. It's also about sharing visual and compelling stories about the impact your organization is having and how millennials can, in fact, help make that difference. 
There's also a piece that I like to think of as, as um, tapping into free agent volunteers. Because millennials aren't necessarily driven to connect with organizations to have an impact and with technology, often we volunteers don't have to necessarily connect with an organization. They can launch projects on their own, connecting through social media and just get something done on their own. So in order to really um, tap into millennial engagement, we also need to be willing to listen and, and um, be flexible in order to uh, tap into this free agent spirit, these new innovative ideas from millennials and other volunteers as well, no matter their age. The next example I have is from CASA of the Pikes Peak region here in Southern Colorado. CASA, Court Appointed Special Advocates, had been for a long time engaging young, young adults to help other young adults, especially in this particular example, those who are aging out of the foster system. And one thing that the young volunteers who were asked to mentor um, young adults aging out of the foster system around interviews and job preparation, one of the things that these volunteers noticed is that these young adults didn't have as much access to clothes for interviews and jobs as they, as they thought they needed. So they recommended to the executive director of CASA of the Pikes Peak region that they start a new store. They even came up with a great name for it called The Hanger, which you can see in this slide here, for donated clothing. And they wanted, they envisioned this store as a place where um, young adults who'd come through a CASA system or a foster system could go to, at low cost or no cost, acquire work appropriate clothing and, um, and interview clothing. And, you know, one might look at it. that executive director, Trudy, could have easily said, we're court appointed special advocates. We are not in the business of running, you know, of, of selling clothes. But she really listened and understood that these millennial volunteers had a vision. They were able to tie it to the mission of the organization. And they even viewed it as an opportunity for high school students involved with the CASA uh, program to gain employment skills by training and employing them uh, to work in this store. So the millennials saw a need, they came up with a creative solution, and as I said, while clothing isn't part of the CASA mission directly, it indirectly helps achieve the overall goals of the organization. So they went with it, and it's a thriving store to this day. So this went well beyond our traditional approach of volunteer recruitment by saying, you know, will you do this volunteer role or will you do this volunteer role? Because those are our options. And instead, they asked, what skills would you like to share with our organization and what ideas do you have for us? And let's see if we can make it possible for you to do that. In my experience, when we think about organizations and generational volunteering, I like to sum it up by saying that boomers were the first generation to say, if I don't find what I want at your organization, I'm going to take my time and skills and go to another organization. Xers, on the other hand, were the first generation to say, if I don't find what I want at your organization, I'll go start my own nonprofit. But millennials approach it and say, who needs an organization? I'm going to get all my friends on the phone and we're going to go do a drive or start a run or whatever it is, and we're going to solve this problem on our own. So how can you as an organization tap into this free agent spirit and be willing to shift and broaden your view um, of the way you've always done things to engage not only the individuals, but also their passions and their ideas to help you uh, address your organization's needs. When engaging millennials, I think um, just, it's going to sound very familiar, just like others, it's important to provide work that is meaning for them. And in terms of retention, you need to communicate clear objectives, but then emphasize how their work has made a difference. So as 
as we shift from talking about generational trends and before we jump into just a few final thoughts about how you can pull all this together, I just want to share a resource, kind of my own public service announcement, about where you can get information about generational volunteering and also volunteering in your own part of the country, wherever you are dialing in from. And that is the resource Volunteering in America. Volunteeringinamerica.gov is a great database that includes data on generational volunteering. It includes data on um, national trends in volunteering. And you can slice and dice this data based on your state uh, as well. So because we're being hosted by New Hampshire Center for Nonprofits, I've pulled up the New Hampshire data, but no matter where you're calling from, you can go in and find out what are the volunteer rates, how do those stack up against national volunteer rates over recent years. You can see New Hampshire is a really strong, has a strong volunteerism tradition. They have out-volunteered the national average for a number of years. But most importantly, I think you can also go in and find out where volunteers are, what types of organizations are they connecting to, and what types of missions are they drawn to in your state, and if you're in a large or mid-sized city, in your large or mid-sized city as well. Unfortunately, there won't be an update to this report since 2016, because the questions were pulled from the most recent census uh, process, but we do hope that they'll continue and in coming years be able to continue to update this database. So to sum up what boomers, Xers, and millennials and today's volunteers in general are seeking out of their opportunities with you, they want flexibility. They in fact demand flexibility. They want to work with colleagues. They don't necessarily want to be told what to do, how to do it, where to do it by the organizational leadership. They want a seat at the table to help make decisions. It doesn't mean they all want to be on the board, but for their project, they'd like a say in how the work gets done. You as leaders should, in fact, determine and work with them to agree on what the outcomes should be, but how the work gets done, they'd like to have a say in that. They want to use their skills or gain new skills, and they certainly want to make an impact. So with these things in mind, how can you pull all of this together to leverage rather than work despite these challenges or these trends? All the examples I shared had this in common. They were willing to create a foundation of engagement rather than simply volunteer management. They all approached creating volunteer roles with an openness to do things differently, to get beyond the way they've always done things. So in addition to direct service roles that volunteers traditionally fill, and board governance roles that volunteers traditionally fill, each of the examples I gave made an effort to, to fill out that hearty middle between direct service and governance roles. They engaged volunteers in roles such as a consultant, a coach or mentor, a project manager, or a team leader. All of these are roles that can tap into what volunteers today are seeking and build capacity of your organization beyond what staff alone can achieve. And that means, speaking of staff, that if we engage volunteers as evaluators, as project managers, as project leaders or, pro or team leaders, that staff may need to acknowledge that they need to shift in their roles. If we are engaging volunteers rather than managing volunteers, we shift as staff members from being recruiters to being cultivators of talent. Instead of being directors of work, we're facilitators of the work. Instead of placing volunteers, we may be negotiating a role that we maybe didn't exist before, but can tap into volunteer skills to address a need. Instead of supervising the work, we're supporting volunteers to success. In other words, and this is our company's mantra,
staff and organizational leaders need to shift from doing it all to instead focusing on getting it done, convening others with us to help get the work done. And engaging volunteers is a way to do that. Before I pause for questions, I'll just share a couple takeaways, a few approaches you can take to, to begin to, to shift further along this spectrum from traditional management to robust, meaningful, skilled volunteer engagement. And I'm sure everyone on this call represents a different place uh, along that spectrum. Here are some ways you can begin to move further along towards really strategic engagement of volunteers. First, assess your engagement. What are your strengths currently? Where do you have opportunities to improve? And we have on our website, and there are many others out there, free and downloadable tools where you can assess how your organization stacks up against leading practices in volunteer engagement. Once you do that, and I would have not just your department, but other departments and leadership and volunteers be part of that assessment, that will then inform where you can make some strategic changes. Do you have real strategic roles for volunteers? If not, maybe you can identify some, some, some areas. Do you really fall short on cultivation or on holding volunteers accountable? Maybe that's an area where you can then pilot one or two new roles for volunteers to take on. You need to be willing to adjust your practice along the way. I love the word pilot. It means you have permission to change and not have it all just perfect and just so at the start. Um, and that, that relates to the sh issue of being open to adjusting and learning along the way. The next piece of advice is to simply start. Don't wait for everything to be perfect or for the right time. Pick a pilot that you think can be successful and from which you'll be learning and that you can build some momentum from and just start with that one or two new volunteer roles. And then along the way, measure success and tell everyone about the success. And those staff or volunteers who are resistant may eventually come on board once, you, once they see that this new way of engaging volunteers can be successful and impactful. So with that, I know we only have about five or six minutes left for questions, um, but I'd love to, uh, to see if we have any questions out there. And for those who need to drop off, um, we understand and we thank you very much for participating. Um, I will, uh, Beth, Beth, I'll see excuse me, what before, questions we have. Before, yeah, go ahead. Before you go to the questions, um, we have had a couple of requests to um, get your slides afterward. Are you willing to um, let us post your slides with the webinar? I am happy to have you post a PDF of our slides. We'll make sure you have that. And then I know there were some questions about sources of research and everything was referenced. So if you look at the, that PDF, you'll be able to access the, the research sources for millennials and some of the other things. So yep, happy to do that, Lorette. Perfect. Um, and we had one other question that I don't know if it's still up on your um, your screen, but Regan asked about suggestions for company-wide volunteer databases, database C, database I, however you say that. Um, he, <laughs> um, database systems for volunteer engagement, is that? I, um, to um, What they're looking for is a way to manage volunteers across oh, departments within an organization and how to share those volunteer resources? So there are a number of different volunteer engagement databases. I'm not going to endorse any one in particular, um, but what I would do is I would, as you look at these different databases, I would certainly look at and use as a criterion for selection what your limits are on having licenses, right? So is it a system where if you want to have people in all sorts of different departments, be responsible for reaching out and, and, and recruiting volunteers from your core of volunteers for their available roles, then you need to pick a system where it's not gonna be cost prohibitive for you to have lots of different people with permissions to access that. Um, and so uh, that would be one thing that I would really look at, whereas other systems are very limited and, and have a high fee for adding more licenses or users. <coughs> so 
<coughs> excuse me, that's one suggestion, and there are some great um, reviews. I think it's maybe it's from Tech for Good. I'm not sure. There's some great reviews of different volunteer systems where they just put side by side in a chart, um, kind of like in a consumer report approach, the different features and different volunteer databases. So I'd look for that and see if that can help you. Thank you. Um, other questions, uh, Lorette, since you're on, do you want to highlight any other questions? Sure. There's one other question. Uh, what is your advice if your training for confidentiality and legal reasons is 40 hours? That alone is a massive commitment that a lot of people won't tackle. So great question. That actually relates very much to one of the pilot projects through the Hive Initiative we worked on with New Hampshire um, a couple years ago. There were two organizations, um, both had missions around helping victims of sexual assault and domestic abuse, and their training was, you know, state mandated to be a minimum of 40 hours. And they knew, just like this question, that that was a big impediment to engaging new volunteers. So how did they address that? Um, they engaged volunteers and some staff to uh, look at all of the modules in the mandated training to determine which could be delivered effectively online. And they worked with volunteers and in the end also kind of a state alliance to take certain topics and make those accessible online so that it was really ended up being only 20 hours of in-person training and the other 20 with tests or quizzes or some other way to confirm skill acquisition and knowledge acquisition. Um, they, uh, they allowed people to take those on their own. Uh, and, and again, it, it was a great project and I think it has led to you know, a much broader pipeline of volunteers. Anything else, Lorette? Well, I'm looking at the time, and um, so I think that uh, I think that we'll wrap it up. Uh, but I just want to thank everyone for participating, for joining us today. Um, we have here on this slide some resources, and um, uh, including uh, uh, our website where you can go to get our downloadable assessment if you'd like. Um, but again, there are many out there as well. And I wish you all great success in continuing and building on the foundation you have for engaging volunteers in meaningful ways. And if you have great stories of your success that you'd like us to feature, or at least hear about, please do share them with us. Um, we think it's really important to share best practices across the field. Thanks so much and have a great afternoon. Thank you, Beth, and thank you everyone for participating. We will have the recording available within a few days. We'll also have the slides, a PDF of the slides available. Um, and as always, we'd love to hear from you. So thanks very much for participating and enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Bye.